case. I'm Dr. Carmona from the Fertility Institute of Hawaii. And I'm Dr. John Fratarelli from the same place. <laughs> We're here to talk to you guys today about fertility preservation. Um, so please feel free to uh, ask questions um, and uh, interrupt us and hopefully you find this to be very useful. Um, so we can start by talking about what exactly fertility preservation is. Um, women and men can both preserve fertility uh, and that can be done in a number of ways. So for men, I'll start with them. It's, it's really um, quite a simple process. Men can freeze sperm um, and they may choose to do that for a number of reasons. They may choose to do so because they're going to be undergoing um, gonadotoxic chemotherapy for cancer or other related diseases, um, or they may be um, deciding uh, to transition. Uh, they may be starting a hormonal regimen, which can harm sperm. And so uh, oftentimes, or they might be um, thinking about vasectomy. Uh, that's another reason why some men might choose to freeze their sperm. And so basically that consists of them coming in, providing us uh, either one or more samples, and then we're able to and store, store them uh, for future use. For women, it's a little bit different. Um, women do have to undergo um, a little bit more of a complex process. Um, and for women, we can either freeze eggs or we can freeze embryos. I suppose embryos include uh, men and women, <laughs> typically. So, um, And uh, we can kind of go into detail a little bit about the processes for each of those. So, you know, for freezing sperm, it, it's, it's kind of a slow freeze process that we've used for a long period of time. Um, for freezing eggs and for freezing embryos, it's, it's a much newer technique uh, called vitrification. And I, I guess I say new, it's really standard these days. But, but um, freezing eggs prior to about 2010 was, was very difficult in, in that we were not able to freeze them and maintain the fidelity of that egg so that, that when we or it, when we thawed it, it was able to make um, a baby at a very high rate. Um, nowadays, because of vitrification, um, the vitrification process doesn't harm the egg at all. Pregnancy rates are the same whether you vitrify an egg or whether you don't vitrify an egg. There was a very nice study done several years ago where they, where they took eggs and they would vitrify one and not vitrify the other and, and then fertilize them and then try and then look uh, to see which egg actually made the baby and, and how the embryos grew. And it was the, they were equally successful with the egg that they froze with vitrification or, or the ones that they didn't. So, so that was a, a, very, uh, a very good study or a very land, a landmark study showing us that you know, vitrification is very safe. Um, and for that reason, it's, it's something that we use routinely now for eggs and for embryos. Uh, and it's a very quick process where, where um, it's, it's technically very difficult to do and only, only um, certain embryologists are allowed to do it and have to be very highly specialized and trained. Um, the, the process though, you know, is in the vitrification, the eggs or, sperm, eggs or the embryos are, are in liquid nitrogen and they're stored at, uh, in this liquid nitrogen, which is at minus 197 degrees Celsius. Fahrenheit, that ends up being about minus 322 degrees Fahrenheit. So very, very cold temperature. Um, and actually it's so cold that they actually bypass the freezing or the ice uh, crystal formation and they go to more of a viscous kind of solution, um, kind of a glass-like state, which is important because then it doesn't, that's what doesn't harm the egg or embryo um, in, in that state. And it could be stored there for long periods of time. There's really no, there's really no, uh, there's no, no time expiration limit. date that we know of. Yeah. Um, in terms of the process for uh, for getting those eggs, unfortunately, we can't just quite go in and remove eggs. We um, we have to um, have women undergo ovarian stimulation. So typically that may start with uh, some pretreatment with either estrogen pills or birth control pills. And that's to kind of suppress the ovaries a little bit so that we can take over the cycle. Uh, and then we have them start injectable medication every day, which they take for approximately 10 days. The purpose of that injectable medication is to cause more than one egg to mature. And we know that, again, what we're trying to do is get as many eggs as we can safely from somebody in one particular cycle. 
don't want to just freeze one egg. We want to freeze a number of them to increase the chances that one of those eggs is going to result in a live birth. Uh, and in so doing, we want to um, uh, cause multiple eggs to mature. So we give these injectable medications over the course of these 10 days. Uh, and then we monitor with ultrasound as well as blood work to see how uh, somebody is responding to the treatment. We can adjust the dosing, either decreasing or increasing the dosing accordingly. Um, and then once we they're ready for the egg retrieval. Uh, the egg retrieval is scheduled and then performed subsequently, uh, approximately day 12 of treatment. And this can vary. It can be day 13, 14. It can be, um, you know, day earlier or so. So it does vary by, by patient. The egg retrieval is a really simple uh, procedure, which is typically done under anesthesia. Um, and what we do is take a long needle, put it through the vagina into the ovaries to collect the eggs. Um, women are comfortable at this time, they're asleep, they don't remember it, and then uh, we, we go ahead and um, give those eggs to the lab for, for freezing. After you wake up, um, you can sometimes feel a little bit of, of crampiness, which is very, very well controlled, uh, and typically most women will go back to work the next day. So it's um, really quite a, a minor and, and safe procedure to undergo. Basically, it's IVF. It's just like uh, when someone's undergoing IVF. And, and the nice thing is that most of the appointments are very quick. So you do them you know, before work or some people will come at lunchtime or just kind of sometime during the morning. Um, and the only time that, that is really a day that you need off is the day of the egg retrieval because you're getting, you're getting anesthesia. Um, and as Dr. Carmel said earlier, you know, for, for men, um, in general, it's just, you know, giving us a, a sample and, and that can be done here in the office or, or at home or, or, or elsewhere. Um, however, some men, it, it's, it's a different process and, you know, because if someone's had a vasectomy or there's some kind of, you know, if there's an issue with uh, no sperm in the ejaculate, then sometimes we have to do a surgical procedure, a minor surgical procedure called a, a TESI, uh, which is just a testicular biopsy to get the sperm. Um, and, and store it for men, and we can do that as well. Yeah, so I think we can talk a little bit about um, what conditions might prompt someone to, to choose to do this. So I th think I just sort of briefly mentioned in the beginning, um, uh, for example, cancer diagnoses for women and for men, if they're going to be undergoing toxic uh, treatments, um, then potentially freezing eggs um, or, or sperm can help to preserve their fertility. Um, the other... Hey, yeah. Let me just jump in there real quick. I think sometimes people don't understand, you know, well, why do you freeze if you're undergoing you know, chemotherapy? Why does it affect sperm and affect eggs? It doesn't really affect other things. Um, because sperm and eggs are kind of like cancer cells. Cancer cells are fast, rapidly dividing cells, um, and, and that's what sperm and eggs are too, and that's what the chemotherapy like, targets. And so it's targeting fast, rapidly dividing cells, which are cancer, but also eggs and sperm, which is why, why you know, fertility is affected when you're taking chemotherapy agents. Um, the other kind of population, and in particular women who may choose to freeze their eggs, um, are women who are not quite ready to build their families, um, but would like to ensure that they have the best shot possible of, uh, of, of having a baby in the future. And I think this is um, one of the hardest things to counsel patients about, right? Because um, there is no consensus. There's no like, yes, you must freeze your eggs by 36 um, or by 40 or whatever it is. Um, there's really no age in which you should definitely go ahead and, and freeze your eggs. And there really isn't, you know, a particular patient who must freeze her eggs or who, who shouldn't freeze her eggs. I mean, of course, there are a few exceptions. Women with um, certain medical conditions, we may suggest that they don't freeze their eggs or women who maybe already have a very low bearing reserve, then it doesn't really make much sense to, to do so. But otherwise, there, there is a lot of gray area and it's oftentimes up to the desire of the patient. Um, one of the things to keep in mind, so a lot of times women will uh, come to us and say that they want to test their fertility. They want to kind of check to see what their fertility potential is and then based on that, whether they should freeze their eggs or not. This is a very, very tricky thing to counsel people on and really to evaluate. Um, the fertility testing that we have is really not very good at predicting what your chances are, if you're a woman watching this, um, what your chances are of having a live birth. Um, 
uh, naturally. So it doesn't predict natural fecundity very well. It does predict how likely you are to have a live birth utilizing something like egg freezing or IVF or fertility treatment. It does predict um, those kinds of factors, but it really doesn't predict your chance for getting pregnant naturally now or in the future. Um, and it, it doesn't predict very well, you know, age of natural menopause and all that, although there's a lot of mm -hmm. literature and studies looking at that now. Um, so, when we do fertility testing, since we can't really use it to predict whether or not you're going to have trouble having a baby, um, we use a lot of markers. We use a lot of um, uh, counseling and markers to kind of help you understand whether this makes the most sense for you at this time. So um, if you are somebody who is very, um, uh, you know, sort of career oriented, who uh, is someone who, um, oh, I don't, I don't know, everybody's, gonna, I don't know if that's really the right thing to say. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I, I think it's more so if you're somebody who doesn't see yourself having a family within the next few years, okay, and you are already in your later 30s, um, then that is somebody who, or kind of approaching the mid to late 30s, and that is a good uh, candidate for egg freezing because we know that at 35 plus the um, uh, rate of fertility as well as natural fecundity, success rates of treatments, et cetera, really starts to decline. Um, and so those are, are pretty good candidates. Now, if you are not ready to build a family, but you are in your 40s, okay, and your ovarian reserve testing showed that you have an issue with your ovarian reserve. Um, then egg freezing is still a possibility, but may not really be very successful for you. And so, um, you know, I, I oftentimes hesitate to recommend egg freezing for those patients because it is it is an expense and, you know, there are uh, kind of emotional uh, as well as financial risks involved in that. And so if it's unlikely to result in a baby for you, then that, that might not make much sense either. Um, so I, I think this is a real, sometimes can be a tricky gray area on how we counsel patients. And I just add on to that, you know, the egg freezing or fertility preservation has become very popular nationwide. They have, uh, they have you know, egg freezing tea parties and, and things that on, on the mainland uh, for, for patients who, you know, who are getting more information. Um, I think that ideally, if, 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 if it was easy um, and just covered and you could just do it, Ideally, what, what I would say is that um, unless you're planning to have children in your 20s, you freeze your eggs in your 20s so that if you're having difficulty in your 30s or 40s or, you know, that you have those eggs as kind of as an insurance policy because you're never more fertile than you are in your 20s. Um, and, and, you know, when, as Dr. Carmel said, when somebody comes in, sometimes it's hard to tell them exactly what the future is going to hold. You can tell them what they what their fertility is right now, potentially, but not what it's going to be a year or five years from now. So when I see patients and they're talking to me about fertility preservation, I tell them the best time to do it is right now because they're not, they're not going to be, they're not going to get more fertile as time goes by. So if they're thinking about it, they should do it um, or at least, or just realize that their, their fertility may decline as they get a little bit older. And, and just as a, a plug, Dr. Carmon did uh, have a very nice blog article yesterday on fertility <laughs> preservation that, that was that was uh, on our on our uh, on our Facebook page as well, or on our yeah, and right. website as well. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that I think patients always ask about is uh, how much fertility preservation might cost, and of course that varies depending on the clinic that that you go to. Sperm freezing um, typically is not very expensive. Um, uh, if um, there, there's oftentimes help with the storage fees as well. If it's a cancer patient, for example, there are certain foundations that may assist with a lot of those fees. Um, in terms of egg freezing, um, that cost can vary depending on your current level of ovarian reserve because that will kind of change the dosing of the medications and the uh, injectable medications unfortunately can uh, vary. So um, egg freezing for cancer, um, similarly to similar to men, there are a number of programs which can actually offer uh, help discount medications as well as uh, discounted cycle. 
Um, and so, and there even are some states that where that are you know considering mandating uh, insurance coverage for um, women with a history of of cancer. Um, Unfortunately, we're not we're not one of those states um, at this but, point. But there but, was but there was some um, a, a, a bill that was going through that was introduced uh, in order to try to get uh, insurance coverage for fertility preservation patients for going, undergoing uh, chemotherapy or cancer treatment, um, and that was a couple of years ago. Unfortunately, it got kind of tied up and hasn't gone any anywhere yet. But we're we're definitely are still advocating for that, and, and hopefully we'll see that in the near future. Yeah, um, and in addition, most uh, centers will offer either kind of in-house financing plans or will work with third parties to help finance um, medication as well as the cycle. Um, so we, we certainly do offer a number of, of financing options here. Um, and then in terms of medications, there are, um, uh, uh, depending on uh, income and a number of other factors, there are some ways that we may be able to, to get discounted medications as well directly from the pharmacy and other things like that so, so that um, uh, egg freezing can be more affordable. Um, yeah, what else? I think that, you know, one of the questions that we get during counseling sometimes, how many eggs do we need to, to, to have a baby? And, and, and that's always very difficult because um, you never know. You need one egg. You need one good egg that's going to make a good embryo that's going to make a baby. But, but in, in reality, the, there's a lot of wastage. And as humans, we don't reproduce very well. You know, at, at mice, one egg makes a pup all the time. But you know, in, in humans, one egg doesn't make a baby. You know, very often, you typically need, uh, on average, in your twenties, you might. I'm, I'm sorry, in your twenties, you might need ten eggs to make a baby. Um, to have a really good chance to make a baby. As you get into your thirties, that number increases to fifteen to twenty eggs. Um, I think that in general, what we suggest is that you know, if you have twenty eggs, you have a really good chance of having a baby. Now you're now at forty-two, your chance of, of getting a baby. Uh, with 20 eggs is a lot less than it is at, at uh, 22. However, what we also find is that having more than 20 eggs doesn't really improve that pregnancy rate of having a baby because if you can't get pregnant with 20 eggs, you probably can't get pregnant with 25 eggs either. But having more than but but having more than 20 eggs does do one thing. It allows you, if you do have a baby, to have other eggs left or embryos left oh, and maybe have more children. Baby, right. right. Um, yeah, I think the estimate kind of on average is only, you know, even for if you're kind of averaging across the, the fertile window for women, probably around 7 to 10% of eggs can yield a live birth. So it's, uh, it's a surprisingly low number. And, and you know, when, when we were trying to get pregnant naturally in your 20s, for instance, you know, your pregnancy rate each month is only somewhere between 20 to 25 percent, depending on uh, on other factors. Um, and so, you know, it, it does take a lot. Uh, you typically, you know, it just natural pregnancy, natural conception doesn't happen very, very easily for, for very fertile patients either. Yeah. Um, in terms of um, protocols and uh, what kind of medications we use and things like that. So uh, as I mentioned, there are injectable medications, um, also called gonadotropins, which we utilize to stimulate the ovaries. Uh, one question that sometimes comes up for cancer patients, especially those with um, hormone-sensitive cancers, like uh, breast cancer is one of the more common ones, um, they would like to know if uh, if freezing their eggs are going to impact their, their outcomes. Um, and there have been some studies on this. It doesn't look like egg freezing negatively impacts their prognosis at all. Um, so it, it can be done safely for most women. Um, we do tend to utilize special protocols for women with hormone sensitive cancer. So um, we'll add in medications that will actually drop the, uh, the estrogen level uh, such that uh, their estrogen level throughout the cycle will remain remain low um, and that also does not appear to negatively impact the outcome of uh, the IVF cycle which is which is nice the other thing with with cancer patients is is that um, when they come in we see them immediately we can see them immediately we can cycle them immediately and get eggs you know within two to three weeks so it doesn't affect uh, their treatment uh, their chemotherapy treatment or, or uh, at all 
So we're able to, to make that happen very quickly for patients. Um, and so I don't think that there are any, there are no questions right now. We right? answered most. Yeah, uh, I think we answered um, all the questions that people had before. So um, yeah, please do. I mean, if you're at all interested in fertility preservation, please do feel free to schedule consultation um, with us or with a fertility doctor near you, wherever you might be. Um, and we can kind of go through it. It doesn't mean that you have to do it. If, if you come in, we can sort of go through your um, particular risks and benefits and uh, what your particular success rate might be uh, with fertility preservation. So, and then we're happy to, um, if you have any comments that you can leave us uh, on here, we're happy to kind of go back and potentially answer those too. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you for joining us. Aloha. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Bye.